Okay, let's open our Bibles, please, to the book of Esther. Esther chapter 1, once again. We began studying the book of Esther a few weeks ago. <clears throat> we made some introductory remarks and observations. King Ahasuerus was both a type of the Antichrist and also a type of Jesus Christ. Three and a half years into his reign over the Medo-Persian Empire, he holds a big feast for all his loyal servants to show them who's really in charge of their lives, and I suppose to punish any disloyal servants <clears throat> to show them who's really in charge of their lives. And we read through verse 16 before we finished last time, <clears throat> but I want to go back to verse 10, and then read forward through verse um, 18, if we can. He's held a feast that goes on for seven days, and we're going to pick up in the seventh day at the end of that week-long feast, uh, beginning at verse 10. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king, to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal, to show the people and the princess her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But the queen, queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains, Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Then the king said to the wise men which knew the times, for so was the king's manner toward all that knew law and judgment. And the next unto him was Karkish, uh, excuse me, Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Meriz, Marsina, and Media, which saw the king's face, and which sat the first in the kingdom. What shall we do unto the queen Vashti according to law, because she hath not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlains? And Memucan answered before the king and the princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes, when it shall be reported, the king Ahasuerus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes, which have heard of the deed of the queen, thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. I'll stop there at the moment. <clears throat> Verse 10 lists seven chamberlains that served in the presence of the king. Then in verse 14, there are seven princes, it says, which saw the king's face. There are two groups of uh, seven. Seven who served before the king and seven who ruled directly under him. Seven princes mentioned there in verses 13 and 14. Since those seven uh, chamberlains, verse 10, are servants the closest New Testament picture would be the angels to the seven churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. God says to each one of the angels, I know thy works. And I think in Revelation 2, 2, the angel to the church of Ephesus says, I know thy works and thy labor. Now I realize that's indirect, indirect to the churches, but that's why I said the closest thing uh, to it, the closest picture. The seven, pic the, excuse me, the seven princes are something else, however, in our text. Uh, they're not only in the king's presence, but they actually see the king's face, according to verse 14. It says they sat the first in the kingdom, they, that is, they ruled with the king. And they are a picture of those seven spirits of God, which are said to be before the throne of God. Keep your finger here and go forward to Revelation chapter 4. 
Revelation chapter 4. And notice there, Revelation 4, verse 5. It says, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. If you want a good devotional blessing, I'll, I'll try to explain that to you. These seven princes in our text are listed by name. If you want the names of the seven spirits of God, turn, if you will, to Isaiah 11. Go forward to Isaiah chapter 11. I pointed this out to a woman Lutheran minister who was riding in the funeral car with me years ago. And she was very, very impressed. Said she was going to invite me to her church to teach the Bible to some of her people. Of course, she never did. But notice here Isaiah 11. Let me begin at verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Verse 2, notice. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That's 1. The Spirit of wisdom, 2. And understanding, 3. The spirit of counsel, four, and might, five. The spirit of knowledge, six, and of the fear of the Lord, seven. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. God doesn't have seven holy spirits, but uh, these are seven attributes of the Holy Spirit. Uh, all embodied in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice here in verse 1, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, uh, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Verse 4, But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Psalm 98 verse 9 says, for he cometh to judge the earth with righteousness, shall he judge the world um, and the people with equity. This is a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul writes, for in him, that's Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, Colossians 2, verses 9 and 10. If you're regenerated by the Holy Spirit, those attributes uh, are available to you. Those elements of the Holy Spirit, or seven, if you will, are uh, yours as well. Ephesians 5, verse 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. Uh, Isaiah 1, verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And so Walt Disney produced Snow White. And the seven dwarves, as with seven attributes, as her seven, seven helpers. You know, if you pay attention and you are reading the Bible, and the Bible gets down into your mind, in your heart, you can't help but see it depicted everywhere you go. And I think the people who produce movies such as that have no idea what they're doing when they depict the movie. I don't think they realize they're illustrating some element of the scripture, some thing that's true in the life of a Christian that the seven attributes of the Holy Spirit listed in Isaiah 11, 2, uh, perfectly match the description of seven spirits before the throne of God. 
Now, it does say the heart of the king was merry with wine in verse 10. He had been drinking with the other princes. But most commentators interpret this to be a drunken orgy, and he was wanting to parade his wife around as some sexual object. But the, uh, and, that, and they praise Queen Vashti for not allowing herself to be humiliated like that. She was a more refined woman. But the text doesn't lead in that direction. The king was mad because she refused a direct commandment from the king. And so he calls his wise men in verses 13 and 14 to ask what to do. In the Bible, a heathen king, or rather a heathen king's wise men, were associated with uh, magicians. Go back, if you will, to Genesis 41. Genesis 41, and notice there, verse 8, Genesis 41 and verse 8. We read, And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. And also look forward at Exodus chapter 7. Exodus 7 and verse 11. Exodus 7, verse 11. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. And maybe a few other verses to illustrate that as well. Hence we have the term uh, magi for the wise men. In Matthew chapter 2, it came from the east. And the word magician or magic derived from these supposed wise men of the ancient world. Now, verse 13 in our text tonight, let me Then the king said to the wise men which knew the times, for so was the king's manner toward all that knew law and judgment. Says the wise men which knew the times, they were discerning about the times they were living in what we would call current events, current affairs, uh, current politics. Uh, they were wise about the times uh, of the day and age in which they were living. But notice how often the scripture uses the expression the times as a prophetic reference to the end times. I'll give you a few um, examples of those. Run forward, if you will, to the book of Ezekiel. Chapter 12, Ezekiel 12, and we read there in Ezekiel 12, verse 27, Ezekiel 12, 27, Son of man, behold, they of the house of Israel say, the vision that he seeth is for many days to come, and he prophesieth of the times that are far off. Go forward to Luke chapter 21. Luke 21. Luke 21. And uh, notice there verse 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That matches what Romans 11.25 says, the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Uh, Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And... Notice there, verse 7. Acts 1, verse 7, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. It has to do with their question, 
about when he would restore uh, Israel's kingdom to them once again. And also 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians 5, at verse 1 here says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. And that has to do with the time of the rapture, mentioned uh, in the previous chapter, chapter 4. But back in our text, in the book of Esther, her refusal to come when the king uh, commanded her to come uh, set a bad precedent, and the wise men of his kingdom seemed to understand that that's what would happen. All the other women in the Persian Empire would hear that the queen refused a direct command from the king, and if she could do it and get away with it, then they had no reason to obey their husbands either. And this is what was being uh, considered by the king and the men that he called in.